So, okay, this is the next talk. It's uh, Newtonian tidal gravity theory. So what we will be dealing with is Newtonian tidal gravity theory, and it still works according to Kip Thorne. And so you can deal with forces and set a space-time curvature. And according to Andy Tony in 1919, when he did his Newtonian calculation for light bending, uh, it was half the value of what general relativity get, gave. But actually what he did was he mi missed out taking tidal force into account for his calculation. So this is Kip Thorne. He's an American theoretical physicist known for his contributions in gravitational physics and astrophysics. And this is his book, Black Holes and Time Warps, and it's got a foreword by Stephen Hawking. So this is what Kip Thorne points out. Thus, Einstein and Newton, with their very different viewpoints on the nature of space and time, give very different names to the agent that causes the crossing. Einstein calls it space-time curvature, Newton calls it tidal gravity. But there is just one agent acting, therefore space-time curvature and tidal gravity must be precisely the same thing expressed in different languages. So. Newtonian physics, when it's dealing with uh, tidal gravity, is dealing uh, with the gravitational force and with the tidal force. And so it's talking in terms of forces. But Einstein is really dealing with the same thing in general relativity. And that's then being interpreted people by people as space-time curvature. So it's the same thing, but expressed in different languages. And I'm pointing out here again that Newtonian tidal gravity theory and general relativity are really the same thing. Just talking about them in different ways. Newtonian tidal gravity theory talks in terms of forces and general relativity is usually interpreted nowadays as talking in terms of space-time curvature. There are various things that Kit Thorne says that messes up this link between Newtonian tidal gravity theory and general relativity. And I'm going to give an example. So this is what Kip Thorne says. Uh, he says, a second crucial proof of the breakdown in Newtonian gravity was the relativistic bending of light. Einstein's theory predicted that starlight passing near the limb of the sun should be deflected by 1.75 seconds of arc, whereas Newton's law predicted no deflection. Um, so when Kip Thorne is saying Newton's law predicted no deflection, uh, presumably means uh, Newton gravity theory. So, and when we go to what Eddington did in 1919, uh, he was made, Eddington was making a prediction about Newtonian light bending under gravity. And so that is conflicting what, what Kip Thorne is saying here. So Kip Thorne must mean something like there is no explicit, explicit calculation by Newton himself applying his theory to light bending under gravity. However, people like Eddington will take the theory from Newton and, and based on that theory, will make an attempt a calculation on it. And there's, uh, or there's some other variations you can try to use to avoid the potential contradiction of what Thorne is saying. Um, this is the type of thing said about Eddington in 1919. Uh, it's from Naked Scientists. Uh, Eddington's eclipse experiment in 1919 and it, the same sort of experiment was repeated again in 2017. It, today, the 100 year anniversary of Eddington's eclipse experiment, 
uh, and that was some years ago. So this is what you get from Ennington. 100 years ago in 1919, Eddington and his associates led expeditions from England to an island in the Gulf of Guinea, and they tested Einstein's theory of gravity, which is general relativity. They were trying to measure how much the paths of light from stars bent as they passed close by the sun. When the moon blocks the bright sunlight, the dimmer light from distant stars become visible for such measurements. And it's usually reported that uh, they confirmed uh, Einstein's general relativity by this observation. But pe some people sort of like dispute the observation as being accurate enough. But general point of view is that this was an experiment confirming Einstein. So what it says in the article, Newton's theory of gravity predicts that the path of starlight should should bend 0.87 arc seconds as it passes the sun's edge. Light, which Newton thought to be a particle of mass, would therefore be pulled towards the mass of the sun as it flew by. Einstein's theory of gravity is radically different. Gravity isn't a force, instead, Einstein conjectured it is a feature of space-time geometry. Einstein's theory predicts a deflection angle of 1.75 arc seconds of starlight grazing the sun. So in this account, Newtonian gravity theory predicted half the bending of general relativity's prediction. But the calculation did not take into account tidal force. So when do the do the calculation based with tidal force, Newtonian tidal gravity theory gives the same as general relativity. So what we're dealing with here is the calculation was based upon Newton's theory of gravity, but it was not taken into account tidal force. And so when you're talking about Newtonian tidal gravity theory, yes, that agrees with general relativity. So this is a reminder of what Kit Thorne said. Uh, he says, therefore, space-time curvature and tidal gravity must be precisely the same thing expressed in different languages. So what we can get from that is uh, there is no defeat of Newtonian tidal gravity theory by general relativity in 1919 by Ennington's observation. Accounts that say that it was a defeat of Newton are false. What really happened was there was a change in description. Newton was dealing with forces and general relativity gets interpreted as dealing with space-time curvature. And that's just what has happened. You've changed the way you talk about things and that's all there was. So this is the type of headline that was reported in 1919, lights or askew in the heavens, men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse. Einstein theory triumphs. And that was a mistake. It hasn't defeated Newton. It was being reported that Einstein had defeated Newton, but that was a mistake. It wasn't. It was just a mistake in the calculation by Ennington. He did a calculation based upon Newtonian physics, but did not take into account, did not take into account tidal force. So that's where Eddington goes wrong. And so it gets reported incorrectly in the newspapers based upon Eddington's mistake. However, once the news media make a big mistake in its report, and it can become very often difficult to correct that mistake. And those falsehoods then get repeated ad nauseum. And this is probably because a foundational falsehood can lead to making more additional falsehoods. As thus dealing with correcting a foundational falsehood means too many other extra additional falsehoods have to be corrected. So when you've got too many mistakes, well, what do they do? Don't mention them. 
and it, they, the mainstream finds it far easier to just try sweeping things under the carpet rather than tidy things up. They would have to go back and correct all the mistaken reporting that was made in 1919 onwards. It's just now a mass of mistakes. And so a great deal of things have been swept under the carpet. And that's the end of this talk. Thank you.